has no significant glenoid bone loss on the MRI. This clinical and radiological picture is typical of a patient with mild hyperlaxity, where the primary pathology is soft tissue and not bony. This is also the ideal indication for an arthroscopic capsular label repair. Patient is being operated upon in the lateral position. This is anterior, this is posterior, superior, and that's the coracoid process that's been marked out. I start with a standard posterior portal for my visualization. This is taken at the soft spot and is typically one thumb breadth medial and inferior to the posterolateral angle of the acromion. The arthroscope is inserted into the shoulder and the first step would be a diagnostic arthroscopy. So we can see that this is the humeral head, that's the glenoid, that's the biceps. And as soon as we enter, we can note that there seems to be a tear here in the anterior inferior glenoid labrum. We'll complete our diagnostic round by looking at the posterior labrum. The posterior labrum looks okay. We then look at the subscap. That's the middle glenohumeral ligament. There's no humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, so no Hagel lesion. The biceps tendon is normal, and so is the biceps pulley. The rotator cuff is normal. We can note at the posterior aspect, that's his small hill sacs indentation, a very shallow one, and this is typical of patients with hyperlaxity. I then take my anterior portal in the rotator interval. This is taken typically at the midpoint between the coracoid and the anterolateral angle of the acromion. The needle needs to come just above the subscap and this gives you the perfect trajectory for your portal. And with the needle, you want to also check that you've got the appropriate trajectory for your anchors. I then put a Wissinger rod in, dilate the portal, and then put a clear 8.5 mm cannulated cannula in the anterior portal. This is a threaded cannula so that it doesn't keep getting retracted out of the joint while those instruments are going in and out for the procedure. So this is your main working portal, and therefore it needs to be a large 8 to 8.5 threaded cannula. I will then use the probe and I'm basically going to look for two things. One is the lesion and the tear. So you can see that that's the probe. That's where my probe is going in between the glenoid labrum and the glenoid. So that's the tear there. I'm also going to check whether this patient has a superior labral tear because sometimes you can't note that on just the diagnostic arthroscopy. I then take the antero superior portal and this comes just adjacent to the anterolateral angle of the acromion. And when you're entering into the shoulder, you want this to be, again, within the rotator interval itself and just anterior to the supraspinatus. This portal, as you can note from the Wissinger rod, you should be able to go both anterior and posterior to the biceps tendon. I then shift the scope to the anterior superior portal. So my viewing portal is now the anterior superior portal and I've got two working portals, the anterior and the posterior. And in the posterior, I'm going to put a non-threaded, a smooth cannula. And this is just a 5.5 mm cannula. So now, visualizing from the anterior superior portal, I've got a good bird's eye view of the entire glenoid and of the labrum. And the first thing I do is put my probe through the anterior portal and diagnose and see the extent of the tear. So that's my Bankart lesion. That's the anterior inferior labroligamentous avulsion of the labrum. So that's the labrum there. That's the anterior band of the glenohumeral ligament. That's the bare area here. And putting a probe in from the posterior portal you can get a fair idea of whether there's any glenoid bone loss. Of course, you can determine this much better on the MRI or the CT scan, but this again gives you a fair idea that in the inferior part of the glenoid, that's your bare area, 
and you've got a lot of anterior glenoid and there's no significant glenoid bone loss there. Looking now for the Hillsax lesion, you'll again note that this is not deep, this is very shallow, and this is something that I would not perform a remplissage on. Once the diagnostic part is over, we get to the second part of the procedure, and this is the release and the preparation. So for this, I'm going to put a soft tissue liberator from the anterior portal and release the labrum and release the capsule. By doing this, I'm ensuring that I've got enough of soft tissue retentioning. I'll be able to retension that capsule adequately by doing an adequate release. So my soft tissue liberator goes in, you find the appropriate plane, which is in between the bone and the soft tissues. And once you've done that, you can release all of this anterior labrum with the capsule of the glenoid. During this step, you're also going to prepare the anterior part of the glenoid, and this helps in the biology. This is done first with the soft tissue liberator and then with the rasp. So with the rasp, I'm preparing the bony bed in the anterior part of the glenoid. So this is the glenoid neck being prepared so that you've got a good bony bed on which the soft tissue is going to heal. I also like to prepare about a one to two millimeter anterior rim of bone bed. So I'm going to take out a very minimal part of the cartilage here, nothing more than two millimeters, so that this labrum can heal directly onto the bone. I don't like to take out too much cartilage because you don't want to lose cartilage out here. So now this is the completed release. And once you've got a release done, by putting in a grasper, you can do a trial reduction and try and see where your labrum needs to come so that you've got good soft tissue tension in the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. I now start with the third part, which is the repair. And this is the cannula that I'm going to use. So I use a curved cannula for most of my cases because this allows you a better access to most aspects of the glenoid. This line on the guide out here lets you know the curvature for your anchor. So I go now to the, about the 530 position. I'm going to place this anchor more or less on the rim or just about on the face of the glenoid, certainly not more than a millimeter or two of the rim. I then put the anchor in there. And this is an all suture anchor, which is then deployed. And once it's deployed, you can check on the strength of fixation of that anchor. And typically in these scenarios, you'll note that that's where the anchor goes. So it's just about a millimeter off the edge. That's my bony rim that's been prepared. I don't want this anchor too much on the face because then you've lost your glenoid surface. You can check on the strength of the anchor and you can see the entire arm shaking out there. Usually these anchors will be very well fixed in glenoid bone. I then use a suture retriever and take out one limb through the posterior portal and I'll pass the second limb into a suture passer. So now this suture passer is going to be used through the anterior portal to take a bite of the antero inferior labrum and capsule. Now, when you're doing this, you need to slide your mouth of the instrument on both sides of the capsule. Make sure that you're sliding this inferior part of the jaw so that it doesn't take anything more than the capsule. So now you've taken a bite of about 12 to 13 millimeters in the anterior inferior part of the capsule, and this is going to help with the capsular shift. So you can note that that's where the anchor is, and my bite goes at least a centimeter and a half inferior. And this is going to ensure that I've got a good capsular shift when I do my repair. I then go for my second anchor. And the second anchor, again, is very similarly passed. This, again, is passed through the anterior portal. And typically, I will not tie down my first anchor. I will take all of my bites. I'll take all of my anchors, all of my bites, and I'll do my knotting 
only after I've taken all of my bites. So that's my second anchor now coming in. So again, I use a curved delivery device. And with that curved delivery device, I get my second anchor again on the edge of the glenoid. This is again the same all suture anchor that needs to be deployed. And once this is deployed, I will again go ahead and take my second bite. Now you can see why I didn't take the knot. So if I tied down the first knot, I'm not going to be able to pass my sutures so much into the depth and get a good bite. So therefore, I don't tie them down. I just pass them, pass all the anchors, pass all the sutures, and then tie them down right at the end. Again, you'll note out here that I'm not taking just the labrum. I'm taking my bite through the labrum and making sure that it goes right into the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So in this way, I can take my anchor and my bites and take, make sure that I'm doing a capsule label repair. Now I've taken the third anchor there. And these anchors need to be about six to eight millimeters apart. And again, you'll note that this is again coming on the edge, just there near that bone that we've repaired. Now for these subsequent suture passages, you could opt as you go more and more superiorly to use a, 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 a suture shuttle sort of instrument and not necessarily the suture passage instrument. So you could use any instrument where you want to get your passage of the sutures through the capsule, through the ligaments and across the labrum. But I find this being the most convenient way of taking my suture passage through the soft tissue. This gives you a good reproducible bite. And my last and fourth anchor. So this comes in at about the 230 position. And for this, I'm going to use my standard suture shuttle. So using the suture shuttle, you want to take a deep bite. And once you've taken that deep bite, you pull the capsule up and then pass your suture through that. This is a suture shuttle device. So with this, I'm going to take one bite, one suture and the suture shuttle. I'll then tie a half hitch and do a railroad. So shuttle the suture across the labrum. So once you've taken the suture and you've tied it there at the back, all you need to do is pull on the black suture pass suture, which is there in the anterior portal and you've passed your bite through that. So you've got four passages now and now once you've done that then you can start tying all the knots and I start from the inferior most so I'm going to start with the inferior most suture first. I'll take a sliding knot and typically I'll take a sliding knot and take at least three four or four half inches over that sliding knot to lock it. So that's the sliding knot. So once that's done, I need to just push it down into the joint. I typically would like to make sure that this suture gets a good bite of that inferior part. And you'll note that when you tighten this, this is your capsular shift. So you're tightening the entire axillary pouch and you've now made this capacious axillary pouch more taut. So one by one, you'll start tying the knots from inferior to superior. And in this fashion, you get your anterior capsular label repair. Remember, an anterior instability repair is always a capsular label repair and not just a label repair. Very rarely would you do just a label repair, and this you might do for a first time dislocator. But in most patients with some amount of capsular laxity, you want to also take care of that soft tissue tension. So you've completed your procedure now and you'll note that this is now a good labral bumper that we've recreated. And this labral bumper basically indicates that you've also done a capsular shift. This labral bumper ensures that you've got and restored your concavity compression effect. So you've converted your flat glenoid, which is like a saucer into a cup. 
and this is your concavity compression effect. You've got now a contiguous labrum. So that's the posterior going to the inferior. And you've also got good soft tissue tension. So those are the two main things that you need to achieve following your repair. A nice label bumper ensuring concavity compression and a taut antero inferior glenohumeral ligament. This patient will now be put into a sling. And for the first three weeks, I immobilize them in a sling, but they're allowed to take their sling out for their activities of daily living. They shouldn't externally rotate beyond neutral and they shouldn't elevate beyond shoulder level. And after three weeks, he'll get on to a dedicated shoulder instability rehab program.